Guy Opperman, Conservative MP for Hexham since 2010. Born at Marlborough in Wiltshire, he was a Category B amateur rider and rode his first winner in 1985 and his last at Hexham Point to Point in 2009. A stable lad with Bob Turnell and he rode particularly for Brendan Powell and Stan Meller. Called to the bar in 1989, spent the next 20 years as a barrister, prosecuting in nine murder trials, and has been a director of his family's engineering business. One of the few MPs ever to have ridden under rules, with Hexham Racecourse part of his constituency. So, Guy, welcome to King for a Day. You're now racing's dictator. What changes and reforms would you introduce? Well, I would make it a lot easier for young riders to start up. At the present, it is effectively the same cost for Tony McCoy as it is for a youngster to start out, whether they're on the flat or in National Hunt. And I think racing needs to review how it is that young people get involved in racing as a jockey. Because I look at the young amateur riders that I see riding in my local point of points, and I think that the cost for them is becoming increasingly large and increasingly difficult for them to sustain. Should they be subsidised and should any young lad or lass come along and get money, a 16, 17-year-old, and get money from the British Horse Racing Authority? Well, I think the BHA need to look at this and ask themselves, are we creating barriers to entry? Because we have certain costs that are inevitable, whether they are insurance or they are the licence application form. And I think they have to really ask themselves for the first time, what is it that we are doing to make sure that young people can get involved in racing? Because I think there's a genuine danger that we are pricing good people out of the market. So why should, as you're saying, younger jockeys pay the same as A.P. McCoy and Ryan Moore or all the other top jockeys? You're saying that younger jockeys should somehow have a, a cheaper entry system. Yes, I think that there is a degree of that already, but I don't think we've really looked at it in any detail. And certainly, lots of the amateurs, I still ride out in a yard in Northumberland, and lots of the amateurs I come across are genuinely struggling to get involved in racing because the cost of it is very significant. And I think there is a real danger that we are going to put people off. You know, people would say it hasn't stopped. You know, the, I think a great trio of jockeys that we've got on the, on the flat and on the jumps, it hasn't stopped them coming along, the very top ones, they've come through the system. OK, there's no doubt that uh, the good people will always find a way through. It didn't stop Tony McCoy, it wouldn't stop uh, Lester Piggott or whatever like that. But I think you are only sustainable if you've got a large number of people coming through and a number of different people coming through, because the person who you may not think was any good at 16, 17, uh, ends up being actually uh, a champion at 27 or 37. So it would be up to the BHA to weed out it, the ones that they, w that they were prepared to subsidise? No, I don't think you necessarily need to have a selection system. I'm not in favour of that. But what I am in favour is a system that makes sure that you've got a genuine opportunity for youngsters to come through. And at the present stage, increasingly, we don't. In the budget, Chancellor George Osborne talked about a racing right. What would you interpret as a racing right, and how can racing benefit from it? Well, George and the Prime Minister are my boss, so I'm bound to agree with them. <laughs> uh, and as the only amateur rider in the House of Commons, and someone who hasn't yet given up his career, I will still ride at Liverpool. Uh, oh... No, I definitely will still ride at Liverpool. I've just got to get... I'm only got to lose about two stone, get fit, and persuade someone that what they really want to do is to put up an ageing, fat politician on their horse at the Fox Hunters. That's obviously the logical thing they would do. I thought you'd given up your licence, sir. Um, I have temporarily given up my licence because, uh, A, I've got a job in the Home Office. <laughs> Theresa May is a very demanding boss. She works me very hard. <laughs> Secondly... I'm in the, we're in the middle of a recession and I need to focus my entire time on this particular job. I don't have any other job. This is all I do. But the third thing is, it's very tough to get sufficiently fit, light um, and mentally all there to be able to ride at the present stage. But what I hope I will do is get through the election, hopefully be re-elected. And after 2015, then I would say, right, I will have one more go at this and hopefully win the Fox Hunters. And all the very best of luck to you to become the next, uh, next Mr Whaley Cohen. But uh, going back to the racing right, now politically, what does that entail? Does it mean doing away with a levy, for instance? Well, I think uh, there are some bits that are quite sensitive because there's ongoing discussions between the BHA, Department of Culture, Media and Sport and the, the Minister for Racing. So I can't talk about it too much, but what I can say is it clearly has to be the case 
that there is a sustainable and long-term form of funding which ultimately filters down to the race courses and the prize money and therefore the owners and the trainers, uh, which is provided for by government over the next couple of years. Now that racing right should be an insurance of uh, sustainable funding in a way that the levy has not been and has increasingly seen there's been problems with the levy over the last few years. So this racing right would mean that all bookmakers would have to pay to be able to bet on horse racing. Racing's got the right to get the right, bookmakers would have to fork up. Uh, absolutely. I have fought uh, repeated battles with the bookmakers in the House of Commons over the last four years to ensure that they stop being what they really are, which is tax avoiders. They are tax dodging. Uh, under any circumstances, basically, they are setting up offshore and basically avoiding paying tax or making their particular contribution to racing. And it is a scandal and they should be ashamed of themselves. And I certainly, along with other people in the House of Commons, are very keen to ensure that if the bookmakers want to uh, participate in racing, then they should be making a proper and sustainable form of funding to that racing. And I, I consider all options open going forward on that issue. Of the big firms, apart from Coral and Bet365, nearly all firms do bet offshore now. And I always thought the agreement when the betting tax was taken off, every bet you punters had to pay a tax on, um, well, part of the unwritten agreement there was that they would stay and register um, in Britain. All bets taken here would be taxable. Well, uh, deals were done in the mid, uh, about ten years ago, uh, which frankly were reprehensible and which have resulted in a reduction in funding to racing. Now, you can point the finger at Tony Blair, his individual minister at the time, or you could say that they were well and truly done over by the bookmakers, or that the bookmakers took advantage of a system that the government of that day introduced. But whatever happens, that's not going to continue, and we need to make sure that there is sustainable funding going forward. We're coming, approaching the time when a consumption tax would be brought in to the bookmakers. Explain what that is and what difference it will make. Well, I think we have changed the rules, basically, uh, as everybody knows, to ensure that, basically, there is payment of... Uh, when, when, the, when the bet is made, there is payment made in this country to the taxpayer and the levy on a long-term basis. That was not happening previously. It seems to me it's a totally logical and sensible change. And previous, previously, uh, the government failed to do anything proper about this, and I'm delighted we've changed it. Do you hope to see the day when all bookmakers come back and they're based in Britain rather than in Gibraltar and other offshore areas? Absolutely. Uh, it seems to me to make total sense. And uh, I totally respect the right of them to exploit the system as best they can, but they need to respect the right of the government to change the rules if necessary to make sure that they are contributing to the sports that they're so obviously using and exploiting. In the corridors of power in Westminster, what is the impression that bookmakers give to parliamentarians? Does this really... Cause there have been debates on it. Um, Ed Miliband brought in the um, Labour Party day and they were talking about the fobs, the machines and the betting shops. And the hostility towards bookmakers was very, very strong. Look, I, I was a bookmaker at school. I nearly got expelled for running a book at uh, school uh, when I was a very successful bookmaker. Uh, and I... I hate to say it, Guy, but you were at Harrow as I was, and I was a school book, a predecessor of yours as a school bookmaker as well, so I know where you come from there. The, the greatest people are always uh, bookmakers to start out. <laughs> but the, the serious point is, they, bookmakers are perfectly uh, good businesses, and they should be supported, and I welcome them on the high street. I'm visiting mine on a regular basis in uh, Hexham in Northumberland, and they certainly are doing a better thing than they were previously. I have to say, the fixed dog betting terminals seem to me to be an outrageous use of uh, it's a subsidised lottery system, and it's not a good system at all, and we need to try and get rid of those to the best of our possibility. Oh, oh, Guy, now you are a Conservative. Remember what the word Conservative means. It means freedom. It, it means choice. It doesn't mean the nanny state well, coming down and saying, you can bet online whatever you like, millions of pounds online, you can bet on virtual racing, virtual poker, you can bet on roulette, whatever you like, but we don't like the fobs. You as a Conservative, that's what annoys me, say, people, we will tell you how you can bet and what you can bet on. Can't you say that is totally anathema to what you politically stand for? Um, there are many different types of Conservatives, and I'm very pleased to say I'm not your type. <laughs> um, I am economically right-wing, I'm European right-wing, but on matters of looking after people, I am very much of the, of the opinion that we need to help them. So, 
if, if it was the case, as you would have it, then there would be no ban against children smoking. There would be no alcohol bans. There would be no drug bans. Just hear me out before you interrupt as usual. Uh, the, <laughs> the bottom line is this. Uh, fixed odd betting terminals are a guaranteed way for people who should know better, but frankly don't know better, uh, to uh, lose an awful lot of money. There is no skill in it. This is not gambling. This is not you and I picking a winner of the 440 at Ludlow. This is basically a complete lottery system with no possible likelihood of winning. You and I know that. It's an outrage and it should be stopped. So why don't you close down the internet where you can bet right 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, everything, that there's no skill involved at all. Why don't you sort of be the nanny state and go and close down the, um, the online betting opportunities? There are actions being taken on a slow but steady basis to review the internet on a number of levels, whether it is online porn or it is gambling. Clearly, there are abuses of the internet. It is a very, very difficult thing to do to monitor, control and generally regulate the internet. And it's possible, but it is very difficult and various governments in various countries are looking at what they're trying to do. What it is easy to do is to control how it is uh, bookmakers operate uh, fixed odd betting terminals, and there is a general view in the House of Commons across all political parties that what was going on, whereby you could lose literally thousands in a matter of minutes with no skill involved at all, and that's, that's the thing that really annoys me. A bookmaker should be about you and I putting a bet on and saying, that's my judgment. The bookmaker makes a judgment that seven to one is a fair price, and if he loses and we win, great. If we don't, if he wins, that's why they have Rolls Royces, that's why they have three three paying in windows and only one paying out window to bookmaker, as you and I know. Uh, there are very few bookmakers doing badly. But it is a skill. There is no skill on fixed odd betting terminals and there is no ability whatsoever to regulate it. So we've gone in and changed the rules. I'm but, quite right too. And I would do it again tomorrow. But the number of betting shops has halved in the last 30 years. So to think that they're always a great success is just totally... I'm a failed bookmaker myself, so I do know, I do know that. But... Guy, as a parliamentarian, do you see that the time will come when the machines will be banned from betting shops? And if that ever did happen, bookmakers say nearly all of them would have to close down because without the profits they get from the machines, they couldn't afford to keep a betting shop open. I think the high street is changing generally. You go to any particular high street, it has changed dramatically, even in the last 10 years, but particularly in the last 30 years. And whether it's the high street banks going uh, from the high street or your individual butchers and fishmongers and people like that going from the high street, there is changing hap happening. And more people are going online to do certain things, uh, and there will be an evolution. But I'm certain of this. There will always be a bookmaking presence on the high street in some shape or form. Going away from that controversial area of bookmaking and um, controlling them and everything else like that, were well, you also concerned about the costs of having a horse in training? Well, um, I've had horses in training. I've ridden for trainers for the last 20 something years because I'm now well into my 40s. Um, and there is no doubt that the fundamental cost to an owner is getting higher and higher. And again, we are pricing the normal person absolutely out of the market. Syndicates? Syndicates are a wonderful thing. Uh, I remember when they first came in and uh, people like the Ponsonby's of this world were regarded as radicals and brave new world. Now they're commonplace. Of course syndicates should happen. Again, you'd say that it is quite expensive to have by the time you've had your colours registered. You know, Weatherby's charge a fair penny, I can assure you. They're doing very well out of racing as well. And again, it's very hard to break into racing as an owner. And it goes back to the fundamental of, I'd like to see a review. I don't think anyone's really done a review of how much it costs to have a horse in training. The problem is not buying a horse. You or I can go to Ascot Sales or Donny uh, of, of a weekend and buy a nice horse for 1000 2000 3000 And you could possibly hit the jackpot. You've got the of dream course, of, of getting a champion. Yeah. And there are, there are, but you don't necessarily need to have a champion. You can buy a pointer pointer. You can buy a nice journeyman flat horse that can have a great time on the all-weather. These sort of horses can be bought for less than £5,000. So it's not the capital outlay. It's the ongoing costs of, of per month of having a horse in training. And I think the trainers need to look at this because they are very aware that their costs are going up and up and up. 
And I know feed is expensive, and I know that having staff is very expensive, but we need to look at how it is that we can cut that particular cost, because the individual trainers will always ex operate in their own individual world. Free markets? Yes, but uh, the free market may exist, but it is uh, how can we make it easier and cheaper? So, for example, there are a lot of administrative, bureaucratic, uh, financial burdens that are put upon trainers. They have to do certain things, whether it is insurance, whether it is um, PAYE, with national insurance or their staff. If all employers outside of racing, they all have the same bu bureaucracy to overcome. Yeah, but what, they, what those employers do, they would have, for example, a Chamber of Commerce, which would then lobby government to say, why is it we pay national insurance in this particular way? Why do we pay PAYE? Why do we have VAT on this particular thing? There's never actually that concerted look at what is the trainer's costs, which is then passed on to the owner, such that the owner is thinking, I'm paying several thousand pounds a month to have a horse in training. This is, you know, there are trainers charging you £2,000 a month to have a That's horse. That's up to them. I accept that, but that excludes, again, the vast majority of people. And it can only be a bad thing when it gets a less and less people involved. Take out Sheikh Mohammed and his um, brethren, mm. then where is flat racing? Mm. Take out two or three owners in um, steeplechasing, then where is steeplechasing? And we are naive if we think, oh, well, these particular owners will always have 300 horses or 400 horses. What we need is a situation where we say, do you know, we need to make sure before this ends how it is we're going to continue this. Interesting enough, I think the dog objected to what you were saying much of what I objected to. It's all right, I understand the dogs. The dogs have their own view about ownership as well. I think they do as well. And moving on to a subject that you and I can agree on, weekend racing. Yes. What should we be doing there? It has always seemed to me to be utterly illogical that we have lots and lots of racing on days when no one's going to go. Now, uh, I, I know that the smaller courses are desperate to have the opportunity to have races on Saturdays, Sundays, bank holidays. And we need to make sure that to the best of our ability that we have as much as we possibly can on those particular days. And it, not only does that get more people involved in racing, you get more enthusiasts, you then get more owners, you get more punters, you get more people going to the, to the race meetings. It seems to be utterly illogical that we are forcing people to have races uh, up and down the country on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays when no one's going. But what's going to keep the betting shop fodder going to keeping the levy or racing's right, whatever it is? You're not saying that there should be no racing or there should be a blank day or blank days in the week. Well, I'm, I'm hotels not... don't close at all, and hospitals and garages and supermarkets, they don't close. They open seven days a week. Why shouldn't racing? I think we've catered for that with all-weather racing. Mm -hmm. So uh, in my area, Newcastle is becoming, getting an all-weather track. There is uh, more and more all-weather racing that is taking place throughout the winter and also throughout the summer. And I think there is still the opportunity for cert certain race courses to have multiple meetings, or, or two or three a week sometimes these are now having, but I do genuinely question why certain uh, race courses are effectively running at a loss by being forced to have a Monday meeting with 500 people going. But they're subsidised, aren't they? So they're, they're paid, the levy pays the race courses in the end to go and put that meeting on so we can get more money back. Yes, there is a degree of subsidy, but the race course can only survive long term if it can get the punters through the door on a big meeting and they don't have enough weekend meetings. I would have many more races on a Saturday, Sunday bank holiday. How many meetings would you have on, on an average Saturday would you have in the ideal Opperman world? Um, I'd certainly have six or seven, without a shadow of a doubt. Well, some Saturdays they do have. I accept that, that. Yeah. I accept that. But I would make sure that the smaller courses, uh, the, you know, the Toasters, the Ludlows, the Hexams, are racing a lot more on Saturdays and Sundays. What about Sundays? It's particularly, I cannot understand in this country why we have such poor quality racing on a Sunday. Well, All right, you have the Kipco 1000 guineas and one or two other big meetings, but generally on Sunday it is dross that they put on, very low quality racing, while abroad it really builds up to Saturdays and Sundays. Sporting events take place on those days. There's an easy explanation for that, because uh, the Sunday trading laws were only amended about 20-odd years ago. Once the Sunday trading laws changed, then racing changed slowly and surely with it. Again, I think the BHA need to have a fundamental look and ask themselves, are they actually laying on enough proper good races on a Sunday? Uh, and it should be an opportunity, in my view, 
for the individual good courses uh, up and down the country to say, well, if the good courses is Cheltenham's going to go on a Saturday, then all the other courses should have an opportunity to go on Sunday because, and they should market it more. But would you, for instance, Cheltenham move from three days to four days, Tuesday to Fridays, would you have it at um, Cheltenham moving to Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, for instance? You couldn't force them, but would you encourage them? Would you want Royal Ascot to end on a Sunday, Goodwood, the big festival meetings? I would love that, and to see if it came generally, as round the world they would do, and in Ireland they do a lot, but would you encourage courses to go right through to the Sunday? I wouldn't change the festivals. So the idea that we change the Cheltenham Festival or we change Ascot, I think... Well, they have changed, haven't they? Because Ascot yeah. used to be the, 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 um, the, the off day on the Saturday and um, Cheltenham has got now to four days. Um, Goodwood's moved on as well. So they have changed already. I don't, I don't dispute that the individual courses with a select three- to five-day racing... Can be, um, can be expanded to a degree. What I'm interested in is the small courses. I'm interested in seeing how do we sustain the, lo the long-term future for the smaller courses, uh, not the Cheltenham's and the Ascots, they're going to be fine. The Goodwood Festivals, they'll all, they'll all be fine. How do we make sure that there's a diversity of racing and a diversity of race courses up and down the country? Hexham, your particular favourite course. The best race course in the country. Well, and, the, and the chilliest. You try riding a lightweight at Hexham, uh, dressed only in silks. It's at 1,000 feet. Everyone will tell you on a snowy day it's very cold. Well, your favourite race course, it'll get you a few extra votes at the I election so. next year. Um, but how many days would Hexham race on a Saturday, times would race on a Saturday and or a Sunday? Oh, it certainly has its fair share of Saturday meetings mm. at the present stage. How many stage. more would you want? As many as more as it would like. I would like the race courses to have the flexibility that they choose when they wish to race, largely, rather than being told. We live in a dictatorship, it seems to me, in relation to authorisation of race meetings by um, uh, the powers that be. It's not so much the BHA, is it? It's a sort of the Office of Fair Trade and all these kind of people involved as to when you could race. So it's, um, it's getting knocking people's heads together. And You're saying, a free marketer. Totally you, you, then you would surely have it I whenever do. they wish to want to 100%. race. Right. 100%. Then we are on this, on this one point, we're totally in we're agreement. Absolutely in agreement. I think we should march on from there. Your professional stewarding, it really worries you. You must have been in one or two inquiries. I have been time. in some inquiries. Uh, I have been on the wrong end of one very interesting verdict from the stewards. Uh, but I won't go any further to say who they were and why I felt they were manifestly wrong and got it wrong. But even as a barrister, couldn't you swear them? I, couldn't I, you swear I them? also represented people at the Jockey Club on inquiries and appeals, uh, so I represented people when they did appeals. Uh, By the way, shouldn't they be in public? Why are they held behind closed doors, these, these, these inquiries? And sunlight is the there? best defence. Transparency is yeah. the best thing. So I would believe in transparency. I believe it should be publicly held. I certainly also would take the view that we should be in a position that the... Um, the Frankham idea of having professional stewards mm -hmm. based in London from a select panel should be empowered and then the stewards on the ground are in reality there to decide things like whether a fence should be taken out, any particular ground issues, any particular local problems. That would allow the stewards on the ground to have a much better day rather than avoiding the gin and tonic as, as they sometimes allegedly do or don't. And you it said it, you said it. Uh, there are certainly the odd steward I've known, certainly at point to points, who's been three sheets <laughs> of the wind. So you want it professionally done at the Hoban headquarters yes. of, say, Stewards' Inquiries, horses to be disqualified, whatever the position Yeah, I, I don't think there is any fundamental difference, given that they all have the uh, pictures transported into their offices from them being in, in a particular race course or being in Hoban. I think, personally, as, as it should be exactly the same, we do live feeds all the time in courts. So the idea that a witness isn't in front of you, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Juries are able to do very difficult sex trials and very difficult other trials with witnesses who are thousands of miles away. If a jury can convict or not convict on the basis of that testimony by a video feed, I fail to see why uh, we can't then judge the quality of a race or the quality of the writing. But isn't Austria's inquiries in racing virtually irrelevant to the general public? They mean a lot for the prize money and who gets the money and, and the... Um, penalties, etc., that are involved. But the public, thanks to bookmakers who pay out on the winner now and pay out on the um, promoted horse both times, so the public don't care. The public do care because, for example, you and I know that abuse of the whip is something that the public uh, care about tremendously. You, I know, are very against the whip. I genuinely believe. Hitting horses, keep it as a rider, you can keep it to steer your horse. 
but not to hit the animal. Um, I'm afraid we're going to agree to disagree. I certainly don't... Again? Again, I accept that. But on this particular point, I do believe you should be able to use the, a stick on a horse. But I th certainly think that the BHA Jockey Club and all the various rules and regulations brought in have encouraged reduced use of the whip, and that's entirely proper. You should not abuse it in any way. I would see longer whip bands as well, and I would see longer whip bands for jockeys who use it on the big race, and it's, uh, it's a situation. You can then get into a situation where, quite frankly, uh, you, the jockey should be banned for a longer period of time. It should also affect the horse as well, because you need to have a system whereby uh, there is a reduced amount of whip use, but at the same stage it's an effective system, and the public do care about that sort of thing. There's no doubt the, the use of the whip is far less than it used to be. Yes, and it, is. it was grotesque at times, and yeah. it, it brought in what, credit what, to all the ruling authorities. What, what Lester Piggott did on yeah, horses on the like minstrel or, on the Minstrel or on uh, Roberto uh, and all these other races back in the 60s and 70s, that's a bygone age. It just doesn't work like that anymore. But how morally can you defend the use of hitting anything, any living creature? Have you ridden in a race? No, no, certainly not. I think then you'll ask that, ask that, question, you, ask that hit... question of any single jockey yeah. and ask the jockey whether it is right and proper that they should use the whip in the right way and then you'll get a, a universal answer from all of them. But, Guy, are you saying that A.P. McCrory wouldn't be champion jockey or Richard Hughes wouldn't be champion jockey, Ryan Moore wouldn't be so successful if they couldn't use the whip to hit horses? Racing would go on. It has gone on. We have don't whipless that. races now, hands and heels races. I know. I've ridden in them. Yeah, so there you are. Normally when I drop my whip. Yeah, um, <laughs> no, no, it's not that bad, surely. Yeah. No, I've dropped it. Like yeah. most jockeys, yeah, I've yeah. dropped a whip in a race. Trying to change it through is Isn't difficult. Isn't this a moral stance that the, the perception of racing but you just said that you just it. said the public don't care about some of these things no now, no they, no no they do the perception of racing and seeing animals hit the only activity where you can hit a living creature is racing still hitting horses it cannot be it's bound to go guy can't you move with the times realize the whip for hitting horses is doomed i love it i'm being lectured by a dinosaur this is wonderful <laughs> this is truly i have truly progressed in my political and racing career uh, the simple point is this I believe that it is right to be able to use a whip on a horse in a race and it should be used in the right way and where it is abused and it should be stamped on and that jockey should be particularly banned. Mm. That's the way forward and I think all jockeys would agree with me. If you'd had the luck, as I have, to have ridden a hulking great three-mile chaser over 18 fences over three miles, then you'd know that you do need the whip.